Chapter 901 Predator vs. Predator Part 1 Verhen. Where did I hear this name again? Dusk asked. He was among those who foiled our plan to take control over a world sapling, my leech. Inxialot, the Lich King, ruler of the Keller region for the Council of Awakened, replied. Liches didn't actually have a king. The title was merely a consolation prize for getting the short end of the stick during the last raffle to determine who would represent the Undead Awakened for council duties. It's the same funny guy I had fighting to the death in a foul moon ritual. What do you make of him? A cunning, devious, untrustworthy young Awakened. Inxialot checked his diaries before answering. A brilliant man like him would write down unnecessary things so that he could afford to forget them and keep his mind busy only with the important stuff. He will make an excellent lich and a fine addition to our ranks, if he survives the process, of course. Mogur is changing, Inxialot. Our eternal life has made us become accustomed to sitting on our asses for so long that by the time we get up we have more cobwebs than clothes covering us. We can't afford that anymore. Dusk tapped his skeletal finger on his throne made of Davris. He wasn't so frivolous that he would waste the most powerful enchanted metal on Mogur for a chair. It was simply the shape that his prized equipment assumed during peaceful times. A lonely, downtrodden man has achieved for 16 years what we could only dream about. Valkyr kept the entirety of the Griffin Kingdom hostage, he forced the very society that chased him out to change according to his twisted beliefs. Not only did he refuse my little sister Knight when she courted him, but he also ended up drawing the Guardian's interest, and now he works for them instead that for us. A necromancer found us, his family, so untrustworthy to side with our enemies. The Black Knight had tried for a long time to bring Balkir in her fold, but had always failed. Just like Solus, cursed objects needed consent to bond with a host. Ilium Balkir knew what Knight was and trusted her even less than what he did the kingdom. Whenever she tried to lure him with promises of power, revenge, or even to give him back his family, the lost Magus had simply struck her so hard that she ended up landing in the Gorgon Empire. Another loser, another pitiful not even awakened human, in less than a decade has brought abominations back on the path towards evolution, whereas we are still focused only on tearing each other's throat. This master brought fresh water to their pond, while ours remains stale. Is there any news concerning them? Dusk asked. None. Inxialot took out another booklet before answering. He had no idea who they were talking about. Some of their followers are more ancient than us and reacted to our inquiries with extreme prejudice. We need to take them out, Dusk said. The Mister. Inxialot had forgotten about their unknown enemies, named the moment his eyes had left the report. The Master, the Abominations, every single one of them. We have tolerated for too long those failures feeding off our prey. With Giera gone, we can't afford our munificence being mistaken for weakness. We've become so pitiful in everyone's eyes that even the Guardians only care about abominations while we lay forgotten. Dusk slammed his fists on the throne's armrest so hard that the resulting shockwave pulverized Inxialot's form for a split second before reforming. Larul was our first real chance to make a breakthrough. To fulfill my sacred mission, yet we failed by the hands of a bunch of insects and an overgrown flower. Dawn's mission was to find a way for the undead to assimilate knowledge along with the life force of their victims. Knight had been tasked with making undead immune to darkness magic, the only element that could truly harm them, no matter if they retained or not a physical form. Dusk, instead, had tried for centuries to make all forms of magic accessible to Baba Yaga's children. It was the reason why, unlike his sisters and his own mother, he didn't despise liches. Quite the contrary, he had recruited most of them for his court, whether they were awakened or not. The Red Sun admired their ingenuity and believed that, even though the need for a phylactery crippled their potential, liches were the key to his success. 
They were the only undead who were capable of freely using all elements. Plants live until something kills them. Their lifespan rival our own, without the burden of our limitations. Beasts know almost no war and are the only ones who can become guardians. Humans keep spawning monsters like Minoher, Thrud, and now even this watch's name who kicked my sister's ass to the moon and back. Last but not least, abominations are the only thing guardians are afraid of and the council is even thinking about offering them a seat since they were all once awakened. The red sun was mad with rage, emitting uncontrolled pulses of mana that were seconds away from destroying his own house despite the countless protective arrays he had laid himself. Mogur keeps spinning every day. Yet where are we? What are we doing to prepare ourselves for the tidal wave that threatens to wipe us out of existence? Dusk asked. We're in your tacky underground castle, listening to your rants. By the way, there's no tidal wave incoming. I forecast a mild winter and plenty of snow. Inxialot checked the entire Garland continents, whether to make sure of it. I was asking a rhetorical question. Dusk roared, and I gave you a practical answer. With all due respect, my liege, if you're done getting on my nerves like an annoying brat, I'll go back to my lab. At least there I can use my time productively. Without waiting for an answer, Inxialot bypassed the dimensional blocking arrays and warped back home. By my mother. It's in moments like this that I understand why my sisters don't deal with madmen. To make matter worse, now I'm talking to myself and sound like one. This doesn't bode well at all. Free Country of Lamerth. Beyond the eastern borders of the Gorgon Empire, in the headquarters of the Master. After learning about the Horsemen of Dawn, the near extinction of the human race on the Giera continent and the ensuing undead invasion had thrown enough monkey wrenches in the master's plan that they could open a hardware store. Damn, if once the presence of the undead was an asset, giving me a perfect scapegoat to blame in the case something went wrong, now they are worse than an enemy, they are our competitor. The master had summoned a general meeting to discuss the issue. Only the most ancient eldritch abominations and those who had evolved into a stable monster abomination hybrid participated. They were the backbone of the master's organization and among the most powerful creatures on Mogur. Indeed, feeding our ranks, finding specimens for your experiments, and even restocking our supplies has become very troublesome. Between the arrays and the rigorous checks, the black market is on the verge of disappearing. With it also goes our main source of income. Xenagrosh said, Chapter 902 Predator vs. Predator Part 2 That's not the only thing that should be on the order of business. There's also the problem of the blood madness that returner abominations like me are experiencing. Bytra said, The fourth ruler of the flames was among the clones that had absorbed their original counterparts, giving them a fresh start at life. Returners, however, would start as pure beings, with only the memories belonging to their life as awakened. Over time, they would remember all the atrocities they had committed and the pain that they had endured after turning into abominations. It caused them psychotic breaks at random intervals that had cost the organization many missions and even more casualties. Every slaughter ended up having too many witnesses to kill them all, and, by reporting the abomination's location, their enemies had been able to unravel what the organization was working on. Because of that, carrying out the next steps of the master's plan was not much more difficult. Last but not least, we must discuss the issue of the returners that didn't join our ranks. They know too much. It's enough for one of them to be captured or be willing to side with our enemies to expose our location and long-term goals. Tezka said, After Lith had killed his clone, the master had performed the procedure again, turning Tezka into a warg abomination hybrid. Losing his prized artifact, Endless Night, was worth the power he had gained in return. On top of that, Bytra had already forge-mastered him a much better piece. She was the rising star of the organization, and everyone groveled at her feet to get in her good graces or have something crafted. 
She had already updated all of her forge mastering techniques, reaching an unparalleled level of skill. Vitra was one of the reasons why the council was tempted to offer abominations a seat. She was the only living ruler of the flames, and her creations dwarfed ancient, powerful artifacts. Vitra was the only one who could recreate an outdated, enchanted item with modern techniques, giving it new life. The Master and Xenagrosh were the only ones who had her unconditional love. The Master had taken her in as a daughter, providing her with all the materials and books she could dream of. The Master had even predicted the risks of blood madness and had treated her the moment the first symptoms appeared. Xenagrosh, instead, was her only true friend and partner. Original abominations considered returners as usurpers, while returners deemed originals as heartless monsters. The Master had a hard time bridging between the two factions, but luckily, Vitra and her relationship with Xenagrosh helped him to find a way to make things work out. Xenagrosh was the one who had brought Vitra back in the fold, and with her origin flames, she was the crucial ingredient in all forge mastering experiments. The two of them were the living proof that nothing separated originals from returners except their own prejudices. Last my chaos ass. Apthit roared. As the representative of Eldritch Abominations, I demand to know what's the status of the research to make us evolve as well. The master sighed in stress. Between living their own human life and keeping all those powerful creatures in check was a mammoth task. I would love to rub his nose on the fact that they were the ones who refused to take part in the clone experiment, but the situation is already tense as it is. Between the lack of food and their personal agenda, regular abomination are on the verge of mutiny. I wish I was in a bard's tale where the hero always has followers who are blindly loyal to him, ready to throw away their lives and ambitions for no good reason. Also, in those stories both good and bad guys seem to find money growing on trees, whereas I have to work my ass off to procure the necessary funds for the organization. Here is my proposal. The master stood up, but they were the only humans sitting at the round table while the others were all titans, so the change in height was barely noticeable. There's only place for a big predator in the Garland continent, and that's going to be us. From now on, kill all the undead you met on sight. No quarter given, no mercy shown. Wipe out the courts if you find them and don't hesitate to ask for reinforcements. Avoid only liches. They are a beast that it's not worth poking without a very good reason. By seizing the undead's back channels and possessions, we'll solve many of our problems. Also, in the long term, their disappearance will lead the kingdom to lax its security again. As for the blood madness, from now on returners must always work with a partner. This way, if one of them goes on a rampage, the other can stop them. We don't have many returners, so I expect originals and eldritch to give a hand. Baitra instinctively leaned against Xenagrosh's arm, who held her hand and made Baitra blush. Everyone smiled at the scene, yet no one but the master was sincere. Xenagrosh could wipe the floor with the ass of most of those present at the same time, while Baitra was their golden goose. They were a match made in heaven and both were loyal to the master. Their friendship heavily tipped the power balance and turned the master's proposals into orders. Rogue returners must be left alone. The master continued. They are not a threat. On the contrary, they are already part of the organization. It's just that they don't know it yet. They are facing alone the humans, the undead, and even the blood madness. We are their only family and hope. If you find them, be friendly. It's only a matter of time before they come knocking on our door. Lastly, about the concerns Ab that expressed, I'm doing my best, but I'm only human, after all. Find me Thrud and her perfected Arthen's madness, or at least Capture Dawn. With her ability to mass-produce the light element, I could feed all of you and fuel my new project at the same time. Without either of them, I can only continue with the cloning experiments. All in favor. Those present raised their hands in unison. Excellent. Assembly dismissed. Xenagrosh, Baitra, please stay. 
I have a mission for you. The master said, contrary to Litha's expectations, the following months were devoid of bad news. Summer came and left, followed by the quietest fall Lith had lived ever since he had enrolled in the White Griffin Academy. Over time, the kingdom adapted to the undead threat, and soon a new balance was reached. The state of alert remained high and Lith didn't get a single day leave, but with two other rangers helping him to keep the Keller region safe, no matter the situation, things never got out of his hand. The reports of undead sightings had become a rare occurrence. Unbeknown to him, the abominations were silently contributing to stabilizing the kingdom, forcing the undead courts to split their resource between the humans and abominations' side. Just like Legain had predicted, the number of the undead couldn't grow indefinitely and was bound to return to the pre-migration level. On the other hand, however, only the most powerful and cunning of the undead from both continents survived. Chapter 903 It's Home Again Part 1 The conflict between undead and abominations weeded out the weakest among Baba Yaga's children, throwing the courts into chaos. Yet it was only a matter of time before they emerged stronger than ever before. All Lith know, however, was that the crime rate was at an all-time low. Between the curfew, the constant patrols, and all the cities now having elemental blocking arrays, it was a really hard time for the underworld. Winter made everything worse, cutting off the trade routes and leaving the dishonest citizens without a good reason to step out of their homes. Once guards could be bribed, but now the thought that the hand offering the gold might be linked to the mouth that would rip their throat at night had turned them into responsible officers. Lith was surprised when Camilla notified him that he had been granted a full month leave that would allow him to spend his birthday home without worries. Are you serious? He asked. I would never joke on something like that. The situation has calmed down a lot now. Military officers can apply for honorable discharge and even though overtime is appreciated, it's not mandatory anymore. Camilla replied. What about you? Lith said. What do you mean? Did you receive a leave as well? Actually, yeah. For some reason, both my commanding officers made sure that our respective leaves overlapped. Thanks for asking. Camilla had expected a rant about his leave being long overdue, about all the magical research he had to do, and all the people he had to catch up with. Discovering that her presence was the first thing Lith was worried about, made Camilla so happy that she felt her heart skip a few beats. I was thinking about working part-time. She said, You what? After months without a break? You need some proper rest and relaxation. Lith was flabbergasted. Yeah, right. Camilla giggled. Your pot-calling the kettle black attitude never gets old. Meaning? He asked. Are you really saying that you're going to spend all your free time home? No magical research, no working on any of those mysterious projects of yours. Her questions were answered by an awkward silence. That would be torture. He replied after a while. I love my family, but once we're done catching up, I would die of boredom. They have their own lives and so do I. Also, I don't know if I'm able to stay idle for that long without going crazy. I feel the same way. Camilla nodded. Sure. I'm going to spend a lot of time with Zinya, Alina, and the kids, just like I hope to spend even more time with you. Yet after a week of goofing around, I'm sure I'd start to get restless. I can't ask everyone to change their routine just to keep me company, and if I spend too much time cooking or cleaning, I feel like a housewife. Speaking of cleaning, can you get home first? I've abused Lady Ernest's hospitality during the last few months, and I'm afraid of what I might find on my return. You, instead, have plenty experience with clearing dungeons and facing mold monsters. Camilla tried and failed to keep a straight face while making her plea. I'll see what I can do. When does my leave start? Lith said. As soon as you're done with your current assignment, Camilla replied. Lith was currently sitting on top of a pile of broken bodies that once had been known as the Black Dragons, an infamous mercenary group composed of dishonorably discharged ex-military. 
nobles, undead courts, organized crime. The list of their clients included whoever could afford their services. Jamble's local constable had requested Litha's help to bring them in for questioning. The Black Dragons didn't like taking orders, just like Lith didn't take a no for an answer. Luckily for him, the amulet filtered out the ambient moans of pain. I'm on leave then. Lith opened a warp steps and tossed them in jail. Will I see you at home tonight, honey? Wait, is it your parents, Zinya's, or our home? She asked. Our home. Lith resisted temptation of answering with just a, yes. I'll never get to Lisha before sunset. If I come knocking after the curfew, it will not be a surprise but a jump scare. Also, I'm too tired to answer all the questions they are bound to ask. Good thinking. I'll be there in a few hours with dinner. See you soon. Camilla sent him a kiss and closed the call. Lith could actually reach Lisha in record time with the tower, but that would leave no official record behind, and he really didn't feel like getting a third degree as welcome gift. Usually Litha's first day home was more tiring than being interrogated by Journey. When he opened the door of Camilla's apartment in Belius, Lith was flabbergasted. He had expected curtains of cobwebs and long-forgotten dirty plates with so much mold that they had grown a fur and might be mistaken for pets. What he found, instead, was a dusty place with stale air that seemed to have been abandoned for months. There was no sign of the camellia, something that reassured Lith about his relationship. It took him a minute to clean everything, five for a decent hot shower, and three seconds to fall asleep after his head touched the pillow. Man, I have so many things to do. Let's hope a month is enough. I need to check if Nalrind reached out to protect her, meet Celia's thirdborn, speak with Faluel, were his last thoughts until the creaking of the door woke him up. Baby, I'm home. Camilla had learned the hard way to announce her presence to prevent a sleepy Lith from mistaking a playful girlfriend trying to surprise him for a real assailant and welcoming her as such. He cursed his own paranoia, put Ruin back under the bed, and dispelled the thunderstorm brewing over his right palm. Do you need help with the plates? Lith opened the door to the living room, finding Camilla with a bag full of takeaway food in her left hand and the army suitcase in her right. She dropped them both the moment she saw him and threw her arms around his chest. Welcome home, Cammie. You have no idea how much I missed you. Even cleaning up your mess felt nostalgic. Lith returned her embrace, losing himself in her warmth and in the scent of her hair. I missed you more, silly. Why do you think I didn't set foot in here until now? Without you, it was just an empty place. Now it's home again, she said, dealing a huge blow to the great wall surrounding his heart. Lith held her even tighter and used invigoration on her. He examined every single millimeter of her body, fixing even the slightest damages he could find down to the cellular level. A blue glow enveloped them both, while Lith made her health as perfect as her heart was. Camilla felt her body relaxing, as if instead of being back from work, she had just returned from a spa. The tension built up in her muscles during the past few months disappeared, and she sweated like a galloping horse, while a warm feeling spread throughout her body. Chapter 904 It's Home Again Part 2 What are you doing? Camilla asked. She was used to Lith giving her butterflies in the stomach, but the blue will-o'-the-wisps in the living room were new. Also, she had been expecting a warm reunion, not a sweaty one. At least, not until they moved to the bedroom. I'm making sure that the perfection of your health matches that of your heart. He avoided using the word body for several reasons. His paranoia made him fear that Camilla would suspect he was shapeshifting her. Also, Camilla was already self-conscious about her appearance because of Litha's family good looks. He wanted to avoid adding oil to the fire. I was going to take a quick shower while you'd set up the table, but now it might take a while. Care to join me? She asked. Usually I would jump at the opportunity, but we're both starving. Among its many effects, invigoration always made its subjects work quite an appetite. 
You know that if I get in there with you, we'll come out only when the food is cold, the beer is warm, and the moon is high. He replied, It doesn't sound like a bad plan to me. She reached for his lips while her hands caressed his hair. It was a slow, sensual kiss that awakened the hunger they had for each other. Lith tried to keep his cool, but Camilla's hands moved down his neck, back, and finally reached his ass. His willpower turned paper thin at that point, but it held. Damn, woman. Kiss me again like that and you're not getting any sleep tonight. He said, make me. She panted in his ear, making what was left of his rationality crumble. A few hours later, after Lith had fixed their dinner at the best of his abilities, they dined together. The first thing Camilla did after getting out of the bedroom was to retrieve her army suitcase and take the camellia out. She then recharged the magical flower with her imprint and put it inside a small vase they used as centerpiece. Why do you bring it at work? Show off much. Lith teased her. No, silly. She giggled. Between the fact that I often slept at the Erna's mansion, the night shifts, and the emergencies, it's been a long time since I knew where I would spend the night twice in a row. I always keep your gift with me because I want to make sure it never withers. Also, I consider it my good luck charm. Her words made him happy and brought a smile to Litha's face, thinking back at how awkward had it been the moment when he had gifted the camellia to her. It took him a while to tell her all that had happened during his absence. Things like his meeting with Zedros or the truth about his battle against Dawn couldn't be shared during a call, no matter how secure the amulet was supposed to be. So that's what you were doing instead of submitting your report. She grunted. First Valuel and now a wyvern. I guess you've a thing for cold-blooded lizards if you prefer their company to mine. Maybe it's because you're a wormling yourself. Oh, please. Zedros is a male and an ass. You've no reason to get jealous. As for Faluel, I'm just messing with you. She giggled, cutting him short. Gods, you fall for it every single time. Guilty conscience much. Lith ignored her second taunt and just held hand. I can't believe I missed even our small bickering. He said, Speaking of Faluel, I need your help talking to my family. All you need to do is tell me when and I'll be there for you. Yet I don't see how the two things are related, unless you want to introduce her to them. Camilla said, That's actually a good idea, but that will have to wait. First, I have to come clean with them about me being a hybrid. Lith sighed. Finally. I mean, why now of all times? Because I don't know how long my apprenticeship will take. I can't lie to them about where I'll be staying, what I'm doing, and with who. That would be unfair to them, and as you so subtly pointed out, it's a talk long overdue. I might bring Protector and Celia along to smooth things over, but I need your help to also find an excuse with your sister to leave her out. I like Zinya, but... Lith didn't know what to say without sounding awfully rude. But she's not family. You don't feel like trusting her with such a big secret. Camilla completed the phrase for him. Exactly. Depending on how it goes, my parents might need a bit of space. We might be living in Belius for a while. Lith hated the city's dimensional blocking array, but it was nothing compared to his fear of rejection. Don't worry. I'm sure that everything will be fine. She said, trying to reassure him. Lith could withstand sub-zero temperatures without batting an eye and their house was warm, yet he was shivering. Camilla stood up, hugging him from behind until she managed to make Lith feel safe again. Stop being paranoid. I had no problem with your other half and I knew you for just over a year. They are your parents and they know you forever. She kissed his neck while caressing his chest. Let's get to bed now. We'll cuddle until you fall asleep. Lith jumped up, shape-shifting into his wormling form while lifting her in a princess carry. I warned you, yet you didn't listen. My word is my bond. No sleep for you tonight. He used his fiery gaze and growling voice to sound menacing. It sounds fair. If you play with fire, you're bound to get burned. Only one question. 
Are we doing the dragon and the maiden or the demon lord and the princess? Camilla asked. Good gods, woman. At least try to act scared. Lith chuckled at her odd choices of role play. Of you? Never. Her words followed by a kiss on the scales covering his fangs gave Lith hope for his future and made him rush to their destination. The following morning Lith had to use invigoration to get out of bed early and not waste precious daylight. Between the sun setting early and the curfew, time was precious. I'm going to visit Protector before going to my parents. I'm curious to see if Naurand has accepted my offer and, if he did, how Celia took paying the price for my generosity. Lith said once he was back from the shower. Maybe I'll go visit Faluel as well. The last time I heard from her, she seemed to have some important matters to discuss. Worst case scenario, we'll meet for lunch at my parents'. I'll keep my amulet at hand in the case you need a warp to Lisha. Yet Camilla was already snoring. Without invigoration, she didn't hear a single word from him. Lith wrote her a note and set an alarm clock, just to be safe. Then, on second thought, he shared with her a bit of vigor, just to be safer. Chapter 905 Meet Solus Part 1 Belius's warp gate led Lith to Dirio's the capital city of the Distar Marquiate, and from there reaching Protector's home, took him just a few minutes. The moment Lith saw it, nostalgia almost broke his heart. His old friend had shaped his own house as an almost perfect replica of Litha's. It was a lovely two-story cottage entirely made of stone with a spacious yard overlooking the Tron Woods. He almost expected Alina to open the door and welcome him home. Celia's reaction, however, didn't differ much from what his mother would do. Oh, Lith, I'll never understand why beasts call you Scourge. You should be named Bearer of Gifts. She pulled him down with a strength and an enthusiasm that surprised him quite a bit. She kissed him on the forehead and both cheeks before giving him a huge hug. I beg your pardon? Lith was still processing the situation, whereas Solus was laughing her ass off. Well, oh great Dark Lord, you just need to trick a powerful Forge Master to craft a few power rings to deserve such title. Should I get jealous? She thought. Been there, done that. Am I not wearing the legacy of the greatest Forge Master on Mogur on my finger along with her heir, oh bright Lord? He replied. Thanks to you, my life has never been easier. Celia said. Gomein. We're about to have breakfast. Feel free to join us. Lith understood what she meant only when he entered the living room. Sitting at the rectangular table, there were Ryman, Nalrind, Lillian, Laren, and a floating crib made of hard light near Celia's chair. Judging from the giggles and child noises it emitted, Lith guessed that it was filled with the new member of the family. Several constructs shaped like small fish swam in the air in front of the crib, keeping the child entertained. At a wave of Celia's hand, the cradle floated between her hands. Guys, you all know Uncle Lith, Uncle Lith. Meet the little Fenrir. We named her after Faluel because of all the help she gave me with childbirth and because she offered to be my daughter's scaly godmother. Celia offered him the barely eight months child with pride. Lith smiled while rocking the baby between his arms, even though to him all newborns were equally ugly and annoying. It seems you did a great job, Celia. She's a healthy child. Lith performed a full checkup out of habit. This time, I can't take the full credit. If not for Faluel, things could have gone badly. Celia said, making Protector turn pale. We'll talk about this later. I don't want to upset the kids. Hey, I'm not a kid, I'm the breadwinner. He grumbled. Yeah, right. You're a big bad wolf that has no trouble hunting down monsters, yet you faint at the sight of a little blood. She chuckled. It's a completely different matter. I'm a good healer, but you are my wife. I was afraid of losing both. As I said, I don't want to upset the kids. She placed her forefinger on Ryman's lips, hushing him. Lilia and Laren were staring at their father with their little faces full of curiosity. 
Ryman could see all the questions about Celia's health and where babies come from that were starting to form in their young brains because of him. It's always a pleasure to have you here, Lith. Did you bring new toys for the kids? He said, grateful to the gods for the children's short attention span. Toys. Lilia said, dropping her spoon to run and tug at Litha's pants. Presents. Laren followed her lead like a good little brother. The kids had grown a lot since the last time Lith had seen them. According to Solus, they weren't awakened, yet they were as tall as Lith had been at their age. It was the sign of perfect body development. I wonder if it's because of protector's genes or Faluol is doing for them what I did for my sisters. Lith pondered. Luckily for Ryman, during his free time, Lith had copied the most popular toys in the Keller region. He had also enchanted them with weak spells to make them safer and funnier. Thanks, Uncle Lith. Your best. The kids said enthusiastically. Not like Uncle Nalrand. He always nags at us. That's because he's never here, whereas I have to clean your mess on a daily basis. Nalrand said, generating several constructs at once. Boxes of light took the toys away from the kids' hands while tendrils forced them back on their chairs. You'll get your new toys only after finishing breakfast. Show some respect for all the hard work your mom put into preparing your meal. He ignored their screams of outrage, making a new spoon appear in their hands. Only then did Lith notice that plates and silverware weren't normal. Until that moment, their dull color had made him fail to notice that they were all constructs. See what I mean? Celia looked at the hybrid with eyes full of gratitude. I'll never thank you enough for sending us such a priceless aid. One day you'll make an excellent house husband, dear Naurand. You're too kind, Celia, he replied. Back home we used to say that it takes just two people to make a child, but a whole village to raise them. In the Fastero household, they didn't use pots, only cauldrons. Ryman ate a lot and so did the kids, leaving plenty of food for seconds or unexpected guests. Even Litha's appetite was a drop in the sea of their servings. During the meal, they made small talk about the situation in Lustria County. The undead invasion had reached every corner of the kingdom, forcing Count Lark and his heirs to invest a lot of money to set up a local army base. Local constables and militia were powerless against anything but small-time criminals. The county needed the presence of permanent troops just to keep the order and prevent mass hysteria at the slightest sign of undead activity. I must pay Lark a visit. I don't see him in over a year. Lith thought, I doubt there's much we can do, but we should at least offer him our help. He's an old friend, after all. Solus thought. Luckily for everyone, Lusha was one of the safest places in the Distar Marquette. Some even said safer than the capital itself. Between the presence of the Queen's Corps, the Kings of the Tron Woods, and Faluol keeping a close watch on Litha's house, anyone looking for trouble would soon fit in an ashtray. Lith told them an abridged and embellished version of his missions in the Keller region, giving Naurand his due credit to make him look cool in the eyes of the kids. Wait, you two met three months ago. Laren had a focused expression while counting the passing of time on his fingers. Yet Uncle Naurand is here for less than a month. Was this snack torch? Snake tongue, you dummy. Lyria corrected him. What she said, really far away, or is Uncle Lith much faster than you? It took him less than a day to get here. Laren asked. I didn't come here straight away, Laren. Naurand replied. The adults already knew his story and Lith wasn't stupid. He could read between the lines. Chapter 906 Meet Solus Part 2 When I met Lith, I was in a bad place. Naurand said. Like the corner where mom grounds us until we reflect on our actions? Lyria asked. Her mind was too young for metaphors, so she took everything literally. Kind of. After we dealt with Dawn, I needed some time to think if I really wanted to join my tribe in their journey. I tried living among humans, but I didn't fit. 
They treated me like the stranger I was, making me feel even more lonely than ever. Then I tried to live among beasts, but it didn't go much better. Magical beasts felt even more alien to me than humans, while emperor beasts were friendly, but had no time to spare for me. They all treated me like an oddity. It was only when I came here that you made me feel special, like us. Laren shapeshifted his right hand into red fur and claws. Exactly. Nalrand raised his left hand and did the same, placing his palm against Laren's. I felt like I belonged. People are mean, Uncle Nalrand. Lyria shapeshifted only her arms, making them long enough hug his waist. Mom tells us all the time that we must never listen to mean people. You finally learned to control yourself. Good job, kids. Litha's hand turned into scales and claws before ruffling Lyria's hair. See, Mom, Uncle Lith is special as well. Why are you the only one that can't change? Laren asked. Because, was her reply. I'll explain it to you when you're older. Now go and play outside with your new toys. Now, Rind. On it. The Razar snapped his fingers, making all plates, cutlery, and cups reach the trash bin in an orderly fashion before popping out of existence. At the same time, a cage of light overlapped with the fence surrounding the house. See what I mean? Celia's smile went from ear to ear. No more washing nor breaking anything. Also... I can finally let the children go out without supervision. Lilia and Lyria retrieved their new toys the moment breakfast was over. They hugged their parents and uncles before going outside, showing Lith how much their manners had improved. Now that the kids are gone, I want to apologize for what I said and done to you down in those caves. Nalrind said with a sigh, his eyes filled with regret. I owe you a great deal for sparing my life and giving me a chance. A chance that, in my ignorance, I squandered. To make it up to you, Lith, I could teach you light mastery. I heard from Protector that you already are a powerful healer, so it shouldn't take. Hold your dragons. Lith was thrilled at his offer, but there was annoyance in Celia's eyes and embarrassment in Ryman's. Something was off. Squandered how? Nalrand lowered his gaze staring at the table for a few seconds before answering. When I first arrived here, I was stubbornly clinging to my theory that you were nothing but Solus's puppet, so I used her name to introduce myself to Celia. You what? Lith inwardly cursed, knowing that the Razar's offer was too good to come with no strings attached. The more I explained things to her, the more Celia wanted to kick me out. Luckily, Ryman returned home in time to clear the misunderstanding. You can guess the rest, Nalrind said. For what is worth, I'm really sorry. Now that the cat is out of the bag, why don't you introduce me to your girlfriend? Celia asked. You already know Cammy. I mean the one literally at your fingertips. She replied. Celia, this is Solus, my first and best friend ever. Solus, this is Celia the one who ripped us off time and time again when we were little. Lith theatrically placed his open palm in front of Celia. Feel free to talk to the hand. E. Celia. I'd say nice to meet you, but I know you since forever. Solus said before the huntress could rebuke Lith for his sass. Since we got to this point, we should do things properly. Celia, Ryman, can you leave the house for a bit? Lith asked. Even though she had been expecting something like that to happen, Celia was still too shocked to reply. She stared at Litha's ring as if it could eat her face at any moment. Solus's voice was completely different from the recorded phrases Lith imbued in the toys he made. It was full of emotions and vibrant, like that of a person. Sure we can. Do you mind keeping an eye on the children, Nalrand? Ryman said. No problem. I've been there already, so I'm not going to miss much. The Razar had guessed Litha's intentions, yet he was far from the truth. Back in the Snake Tongue Mountains, he had only seen what Lith wanted to show him. Lith opened a warp steps, leading to the mana geyser in the Tron Woods, while feeling the turmoil in Solus's mind. 
It was a mix of excitement and fear of rejection. Don't worry about it. She'll love you, Lith thought. Solus jumped off his finger, being careful to not shapeshift into her spider form out of habit. She knew how human minds worked, and she didn't want Celia to perceive her as anything less than human. She turned to Liquid and dug into the ground unseen. The tower emerged a split second later, now a three-story building with the second floor almost restored. Sadly, almost wasn't enough to even clear the debris leading to the new level. Good gods. Celia and Ryman said in unison, while holding their hands out of fright. Celia had seen plenty of marvel since she had started her relationship with Ryman, but a building over 10 meters, 33 feet, high and with a base larger than her house popping out of thin air was something that only happened in myths. Protector, instead, was shocked seeing how much it had grown compared to the last memory he shared with Lith. Also, unlike Celia, he could perceive the massive amount of energy that coursed throughout the building, making it look like a fortress. Please come in, Lith said. To make matters worse for his guests, from the moment the tower had appeared Lith seemed to have grown as well. His stature was unchanged, but his presence was much more overbearing as if he could squash them like bugs. Lith had no hostility toward them, so the feeling of dread lasted only for a second. Only once they stepped in, did Solus appear. Oh, gods, it's much bigger on the inside. Celia watched in amazement at the solid staircases in white stone leading to the adjacent floors and the many doors on the walls. It is. The ground floor is designed for the living quarters. Bedrooms, living room, kitchen, and stuff like that. The basement is for my labs and the first floor, well, it's easier if I show you. Before I give you a tour, allow me to introduce you to Solus again, Lith said. E. Salia. E. In. Solus came out of her bedroom. She was in her luminous human form and wore a set of hunter clothes that closely resembled Celia's. It consisted of a leather hunting jacket over a green shirt, green cargo pants, and brown hunting boots. Solus avoided floating to not scare her guest, which emphasized her diminutive stature. With her 1.54 meter, 5 feet 1 inch, she was a good head shorter than Celia and barely reached Ryman's chest. Chapter 907 Open Wounds Part 1 Oh gods, I need to sit down. Despite Solus's best efforts, Celia could feel her knees buckling. The golden hair, the luminous body, and the majestic aura that surrounded Solus made her look like someone out of a fairy tale. Oh gods, where does this thing come from? Celia flinched when a comfortable armchair appeared out of thin air. It's good to finally meet you in person, Solus. Ryman offered her his hand, but she hugged him instead. Protector wasn't just a business partner, he was their oldest friend. Same here. What do you think? She said after taking a few steps back and turning around to let him see her full figure. You're a lovely young woman. Ryman nodded. Yeah, how old are you? Celia asked. Centuries old, but since I've forgotten almost everything about my past life, my mental age is around 20. Solus said. Lith had them move to the living room before starting to explain things properly. Let me get this straight. Celia said after the question and answer session was over. You found her when you were four, but she didn't get a body until last year, correct? Yes. Lith nodded. Are you cheating on Camilla, young man? Because I like that girl and if after everything you went through together you hurt her, awakened or not I'm going to kick your ass. Celia said. I've never cheated on anyone in my life. Lith was outraged by her accusation. Solus and I work and live together, but we have separate rooms. Why don't you explain to us in your own words how you feel about each other, then? Celia crossed her arms and legs, clearly unconvinced. Lith opened his mouth and raised his forefinger, yet no word came out. If I say she's my moral compass, I'll sound like a madman. Saying that she's my better half or the fairy on my shoulder would be even worse. 
he thought, my life companion, my other half, my most beloved person, by my maker, why do only expressions that make it sound like we're married come to my mind? Solace thought, it's complicated. They replied in unison, I can see that. Celia said, if you don't mind, I'd like to talk to Solace alone. Lith and Protector left the living room, moving to the upper floor. Lith wanted to show him the mirror hall and take a look at the Tron Woods. I won't mess with your personal life because it's not my place. Yet from what I understand, your only friends are Nika, Tista, Ryman, and Kala. Correct. Celia asked, receiving a nod in reply. No offense, but I think that a newborn vampire, a young woman with no life experience, an oaf that told his wife about being an emperor beast only after their first child was born, and a wannabe lich don't have much wisdom to offer you. I don't know how much of what I experienced in our relationship so far was really lith, and how much it was actually you, but I'm willing to find out. We both don't have many friends, and we could use some company. If you ever need to talk about how it feels to be lonely, in love, or even just human, feel free to contact me. Celia shared with Solus her communication rune. Thank you very much. Solus's smile was gleaming, and not only that. We have a month's leave, and I don't hang out with Lith while he stays with his girlfriend. I would love to spend some time together. You have no idea how many questions I've got. Solus stared at the little bundle that was Fenrir, resting between Celia's arms. The huntress couldn't bear the thought of being separated from her daughter, not after coming so close to losing her. Celia could entrust Lilia and Laren to Naurind, but not Fenrir. It was the same feeling that Alina still had for Lith after all those years. Do you want to hold her? Celia asked, noticing Solus's gaze. Yes, but actually no. I'm stronger than I look and quite clumsy. Solus replied, Don't worry. Babies are stronger than they look, too. Especially hybrids. Celia stood up and slowly moved around the table, passing the child to Solus who froze in panic. She treated the sleeping baby as if it was a ticking bomb wrapped around a priceless piece of art. Oh, gods. She's so small and beautiful. Solus said once she recovered from the shock. I can't believe Lith considers all children ugly and never hesitates to kill them. Lith what? Celia instinctively moved her hand to the knife hidden inside her boot. Oh, sorry. It's not like you think. We rarely kill human younglings. Most of the time it's just monsters, undead, or abominations. Solus tried to fix her blunder, only making things worse. Sister, you have problems, but we'll talk about this another moment. I better get back home, it's late. Celia retrieved the baby, making Solus worry she had managed to make and lose a friend in less than one day. Then, she looked at the sun coming from one of the windows and she realized they had lost track of time. We're going to be late for lunch, Solus blurted out. Yeah, and I've yet got to prepare ours. Nalrind is a great babysitter, but a terrible cook. He's forbidden to use the stove except for warming non-explosive liquids. Celia's remark made Solus really curious, but there was no time for questions. Solus used the wart mirror to return the fast arrows home, and then Lith flew home as fast as he could. Fuck Nalrind and his big mouth. I was supposed to check on Celia, talk with Faluel, and then spend the morning with Mom. He thought, well, I'm happy that you introduced me to Celia. Now I have a place to stay while you speak with Faluel. It didn't happen as you planned it, but I think it could have been much worse. Did you ask Protector for help? Solus asked. Yeah, he agreed to provide support for when I tell my family that I'm a hybrid and unawakened. All I need is to set a date. I was thinking about my birthday. Are you serious? Solus was flabbergasted by the news. Yes, it's time to come clean about a few things. I don't need to hide in the shadows anymore neither from them nor Camilla. Lith thought, do you think I should invite Faluel as well? 
She has a weak spot for kids, so knowing my little ones could make her reinforce her protection. Also, knowing her could smooth the transition for my family. Two birds with one stone. I don't know. Your trump card is Celia and her kids. They know her quite well, and she can provide them with all the support your parents might need. I'm afraid that crowding them with powerful creatures might backfire and scare them instead. Solus said. Point taken. Lith flew at breakneck speed, yet arrived home only one hour before noon. Just like Camilla, Lith had learned to announce his presence to avoid being accidentally shot down because someone mistook him for an enemy. He slowed down the moment his house was in sight and landed far away enough for people to recognize him. The farmhands were well-trained and most of them had their alarm whistle pressed against the lips to signal their masters the necessity to activate the numerous arrays that Lith had placed around the house. Chapter 908 Open Wounds Part 2 Litha's paranoia was like a disease, spreading and infecting all those who worked for or with him. Even the member of the Queen's Corps were seconds away from blasting him down with their wands. E. Mum. I'm home. He opened his arms for a hug while crossing the threshold. Lith, what a wonderful surprise. I wasn't expecting you at all. Alina dropped the quill she was checking the farm's accounts with and ran to welcome him. She was a graceful woman in her late thirties, but thanks to Litha's treatments, she didn't look a day past thirty. She was well endowed in all the right places, with a fit body honed through hard work. Alina's shoulder-length hair was of beautiful light brown color, with shades of red highlighted throughout. The sunlight coming from the windows made her hair look like there were flames dancing within. She looked carefully at Lith, checking his clothes for holes, his hands for injuries, and then his face for any sign of malnutrition or weight loss. Mom, I'm an adult and the number one ranked ranger in the entire Griffin Kingdom. I can take care of myself, Lith said. He still had his arms opened, making him feel like he was getting a body inspection rather than a welcome. All the magic in the entirety of Magger can't change the fact that I'm your mother and you're my son. It's my right and duty to worry about you. But mom, no matter how much time passed, Alina always made him feel like when he was still a child and she checked his clothes during winter to make sure he wouldn't catch a cold. Shut up and give your old mom a hug. With her 1.65 meters, 5 feet 5 inches of height, Alina was small compared to Lith, yet her arms were the safest place in the world to him. Never say that, mom. You're not old. Lith rested his head on her shoulder. I'm not getting any younger for sure. Yet, neither you nor Tista have given me a grandchild. Alina wanted to sound stern, but she was seconds away from bursting into tears. She hadn't seen her son for months, and the only thing that had allowed her to keep her sanity for so long was constantly checking with his contact, rune on her own communication amulet. As long as the little piece of gibberish was there, Alina had the proof that wherever he was, her son was still alive. With all the horrible news that she received from Journey and Tista about what was happening in the kingdom, Alina never dared to call Lith when his rune was available, afraid of bothering him or endanger his life. You can't keep Camilla waiting forever, you know? May the gods bless that woman. We've been so scared during the last year, always afraid you had been captured or disappeared somewhere. She's been our rock. Without her, your father and I would have died of fright. Lith wanted to rebuke his mother for ruining their reunion with her nagging, but her sniffling and quivering between his arms made him feel in full the weight of his actions. I'm sorry for making you worry, Mom. I should have called more often. He said, Don't worry. It's all in the past now. Despite her words, Alina refused to let him go. How long will you stay this time? The whole month. Litha's reply made her flinch. Really? Alina pushed him away just enough to hold his face between her hands and look him in the eyes. Really? A full month? Yep. Really? Mom, not again. Do you need to hear it from my commanding officer to believe it? 
You can ask Camilla as well if you want. She'll join us for lunch. Lith was annoyed, but mostly with himself. Alina's reaction spoke volumes of how little time he devoted her. Camilla is coming here? Now. Alina's touch turned into a grip, squeezing Litha's cheeks. She got a month's leave as well. We have plenty of time to catch up and... Why didn't you tell me sooner? I have nothing ready and I have yet to invite Zinya. Oh, gods. I'll never make it in time. Between her trembling and her obsessive staring at the clock, she reminded Lith of the white rabbit. Don't worry, mom. It's just lunch. Also, what's the delicious smell that comes from the stove? Lith tried to calm her down. How can you say call it just lunch? It's our first meal together, so it's very important. The gruel for you, father, and I is not proper food, you fool. Alina took the pot off the stove and stored it inside her dimensional item. Then, she moved to the pantry and selected the best ingredients for the best meal she could prepare with what time she had left. I can help you, Mom. It will be like the old times when we cook together for the whole family. Lith had eaten many things during his early life just to quell his hunger, but nothing that Alina had ever fed him with could be labeled as gruel. Back before he started to hunt, their house was poor and they didn't have much to eat. Their meals lacked quality and quantity, but hunger and all the care Alina put into her cooking had made them delicious. Nonsense. You're tired and need to rest. Take a seat. We'll talk while I cook. Alina fixed her hair in a ponytail with a hair clip after wearing an apron. Do you really think that cooking can be tiring for me? You know I'm going to use magic. In this case, I'll take up your offer. She hugged him again. A little tear streamed down her cheek while the memories of all the time she had spent in the kitchen with her son flashed in front of her eyes. When Alina let him go, Lith found himself wearing an apron and his mother took more food out of the pantry. How the heck did you do that and what is all that stuff? Lith tried to take the apron off, but the knot was too tight. Secret of the trade. As for lunch, with your help we can aim a lot higher. Cut and peel these vegetables, please. I'll season the meat and prepare the stuffing. Alina said. Suddenly, Lith wasn't so sure that making his mom a surprise had been a good idea. He spent the following hour talking only to receive and give instructions while they prepared the equivalent of a Thanksgiving meal. Why don't you hire a housemaid for this kind of stuff? Lith asked once they were done with the preparations and the only thing left to do was waiting. Do you mean cooking? Alina clicked her tongue. Now that you and your sisters are all grown up and moved out, I only have to take care of Aaron and your father. I may be older, but cooking for three is nothing compared to do it for seven. Alina found herself unable to continue. Orpal was an old but never closed wound, while she still couldn't believe that Tryon had abandoned his family because of his feeling of rivalry with Lith. The room fell into a grieving silence, only broken by the gurgling sounds that came from the pots. Alina spaced out, her eyes veiled by too many questions that she would never find an answer to. Lith missed his brothers as much as he could miss a hole in his head, but he stood quietly out of respect for his mother's suffering. Chapter 909 Bad News Part 1 Was I a bad mother? Alina suddenly asked. Lith turned his head abruptly, incapable of making sense of her absurd question. Is it my fault if all my sons have given up on me one after the other? Do you think that Aaron will hate me as well once he grows up? I think that between the constant worry and your surprise visit you broke her. Solace thought. Meaning? He asked. Your mother was in pain all this time, you numbnuts. She probably lived in fear that you weren't calling home because you had decided to follow Trine's footsteps and ghost her. Don't be silly, mom. You're the reason why I didn't raise Lusha to the ground the moment I learned magic. Lith couldn't bear the thought of resembling his older brother. He wanted to have nothing in common with Tryon, not even a similar haircut, let alone make Alina suffer as Tryon did. Thanks, dear. 
Alina laughed at what she considered a joke. You did the best you could for all of us, always going the extra mile, even if it meant giving up the little you had saved. Lith took her hand, refusing to let his mother beat herself up. All of your children love and respect you, but sooner or later, we have to grow up and find our own path. Orpal chose self-destruction, while trying his own pride. As for Rina, well, I seem to recall her being your pride and joy for marrying in Lusha and giving you two grandchildren. You are all my pride and joy, silly. Alina sniffed. By the way, your sister will probably move here for the last month pregnancy now that you are home. You should give Rina a warp. She's trouble moving lately, so I can only see her when I visit Lisha. Don't worry, Mom. I'll bring Rina, Lyria, and even Sentin along. Lith was about to open the portal when Alina stopped him. Was the even really necessary? Sentin is a good man. Also, remember to knock. If you open a gate in the middle of their living room, you'll give Rina a heart attack. They are not used to your visits anymore. Alina's words sounded like genuine worry and mild scolding, making Lith sigh. He appeared in front of the Proud Hammer's house, yet it was the Verhen crest that was engraved on the door and walls. It represented a black dragon coiled around a tower. A magic staff and a sword were crossed behind them, symbolizing all Litha's and Solus's skills. Every time Solus looked at the Verhen coat of arms, she brimmed with joy. It not only represented their bond, but also how Lith considered her part of his family. After knocking on the door, Lith heard quarreling from inside. You shouldn't tire yourself answering the door. Lith recognized Surma's voice. She was Rina's mother-in-law. You already moved my bed here to not make me climb the stairs. I can at least open a goddamn door. I'm pregnant, not crippled. Rina's voice was angry like Lith had never heard her before. Oh shit. I might have just gone from the frying pan into the fire. Lith thought. Luckily for him, Rina's face lighted up with joy seeing him. She was a gorgeous woman, 24 years old. Rina was 1.70 meters, 5 feet 7 inches, tall with shoulder-length blonde hair with shades of black and bright brown eyes. Pregnancy had made her bosom and belly impressing. Lith, it's so good to see you. She tried to throw her arms around his neck and almost tripped for the excess weight leaning forward. To make matters worse, she never called him by name unless she was about to scold him. Lith held her carefully, testing the danger level of the area. Twins. The thought was terrifying for him. Oh great, we meet for the first time in over half a year, and even you can't see past my belly? Her voice turned angry again. Besides, you would know already if you bothered asking those few times you called. You scared mom to death, little runt. Don't you dare to do that ever again. She wagged her finger at Litha's nose, just like she did back when they were little and he disappeared in the Tron woods for too long. Im surisis. I'll be more careful in the future. Lith found himself repeating his old lines. He was slowly realizing how many things he had missed by neglecting his family and how much suffering they had gone through because of him. You're all right, that's what matters. Her voice was now sweet and motherly, filled with the relief of seeing Lith in one piece. Rina hugged him tight, while sobbing softly. I don't know whether to find scarier her mood swings or the fact that she's right. Lith thought, do you need a checkup? He asked. Gods, yes. You have no idea how hard it has been for me since Tista left. The new healer is good, but he can't compare to having white griffin quality medical assistance 24-7. Rena let Lith help her to a couch while she told him about the discomfort she had experienced. More than symptoms, it sounded like a grocery list. Gads. No. Lith thought while using invigoration on Rena. Congratulation on your triplets. Do you want to know the gender? He relieved her back from the inflammations, regulated her hormonal imbalances, and got rid of all the aches tormenting her. No thanks. I want it to be a surprise. Are they healthy? 
Rina's voice almost sounded like a moan of pleasure as her body relaxed for the first time in months. Of course they are. Leet Leet. One of them had inherited the same disease as Tista. His little lungs were filled with impurities, to the point that Lith doubted he would survive for long once the umbilical cord was removed. Thank you so much. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong. Maybe I'm just paranoid. It runs in the family. Rena chuckled along with Lith. The bad news is that being a congenital disease, I can't treat it with normal light magic. The good news is that after my breakthroughs and managing to treat such a bad case like Zedrosa's, this little guy should be easy. He thought, there's no such thing as easy when dealing with a life force that weak. Solus said, you must tell Rena the truth. Healing the baby might take a lot of time, just like with Zedros, and you can afford neither being distracted or interrupted. Not going to happen. In her state, stress could send her into labor, and then I'd be putting four lives at stake instead of one. I'm going to tell her only once she and the babies are safe. And I'll do it only because she needs to be aware of being the carrier of the disease, otherwise the next time we might not be so lucky. Lith shuddered at the thought. Rena was overjoyed at the idea of returning to her ancestral home with her beloved brother and personal healer. The mention of the big meal waiting for her sweetened the deal, since all those emotions had made Rena work quite an appetite. Truth to be told, those days almost anything did. Eating for four was a tough job, but someone had to do it. Chapter 9 10 Bad News Part 2 Her daughter, Lyria was delighted to have her favorite uncle back. Lith would have been highly complimented for such words if it weren't for the fact that he was the only uncle she had. From what she had heard about them, Lyria imagined Tryon and Orpal with monstrous features, whereas she considered Aaron like a little brother. She was the one taking care of him, not the other way around. Are you all right, uncle? She extended her arms upwards, in a plea to be held. Lyria was now a little past four years old, yet she was already 1.1 meters, 3 feet 7 inches, tall. She had taken her mother's eyes and hair along with her grandmother's grace. She was as lithe as a cat and almost as strong-willed. Mom and Grandma cried a lot. Once they cried so hard that I thought you were dead, so I started crying too. Her words managed to make him feel even worse, but... He sucked it up and smiled. I'm fine, thank you. I just had a lot of work to do and some issues with my amulet. Lith lifted her from the ground with ease, as if she was weightless. Wow, lying to a child. That's a new low, even for you. Solus sneered. Sentin, Rena's husband, was surprised by the invitation. Lith's family was kind to him, yet... He couldn't shrug off the feeling of being an unwanted guest every time he was there. Usually, he would politely decline, but he couldn't stand being apart from his wife in such a critical moment. After warping Rena, Lith picked up Camilla and together invited Zinya. Luckily, during the last renovation, Raz had planned the living room so that it could host their son's private events, engagement parties included, so there was plenty of space at the table for the guests. The only person who didn't make it to the homecoming lunch was Tista. With a single hour's notice, she couldn't make in time to the nearest city gate, nor could she just drop her clients out of the blue. You'll pay for this, Lithfer Hen, she said, making him happy to not have a middle name. The meal was delicious and the mood joyful. Lith gave presents to everyone. Useful enchanted items for the adults and toys for the children. Yet there were two sour notes ruining the reunion for him. The first was the fact that once the initial relief had passed, everyone was pissed off with him, whereas Camilla was held in high regard. She had done her best during the last few months, covering for his shortcomings and keeping his family updated about Litha's well-being. The Verhens didn't meet Camilla since Litha's last visit, but they had heard from her almost every day and considered her as part of their family. Last, but not least, there was the issue with Rena's unborn child. It's a very odd situation. 
Tista's illness has never been observed in male patients. Lith had thoroughly studied the disease as Nana's apprentice first and at the White Griffin later. Usually, treating a congenital condition required body sculpting, but Lith had used invigoration as a kid to get rid of all the damages and symptoms. By the time he had learned about Tear 5 healing magic, Tista's self-awakening process had already fixed the imperfection her life force had been born with. Indeed, maybe we should try asking for help. Solis said, Degenerative diseases are already hard to treat in children. Getting rid of them while the baby is still in the womb is even worse. Yeah, it took me over a month to treat Tista, but she was self-sufficient and could help me understand when to stop the treatment. Not only does the unborn child not have that much time, but I must also avoid triggering labor or damaging his mother and siblings. On top of that, I must also perform the procedure without Rena knowing. If she freaks out, there's no telling the possible consequences the domino effect might have. Lith leaned against an open window, staring at the clear sky looking for answers. A kiss for your thoughts. Camilla gave him a peck the moment he turned his head, sparking a debate about their relationship among the children that soon spread to their respective families. Lyria kind of resented Fry and Philia, Zinya's children, for calling Lith uncle without having received her approval first. She was younger than them, but she knew Lith for much longer and in her mind that gave her priority claim. Camilla knew him well enough to see the troubled expression hidden behind his poker face. To his family, Lith was akin to a god. They had problems even considering the idea there was something he might not be able to do. Camilla, instead, saw him as a man with great powers and even greater challenges ahead of him. Lith only showed his strongest side to his family, whereas he allowed himself to be weak in front of her. Are you worried about revealing your hybrid nature to them? If so, there's nothing to be afraid of. As long as you're all right, they wouldn't even care if you had a head coming out of your ass. She whispered while holding his hand. No, it's not that. I mean, not only that. Lith gave her the gist of his current situation. When she heard about the baby, Camilla tensed up and her smile disappeared. Maybe we should continue this conversation outside. She had recovered her amiable countenance almost immediately, and even Lith was amazed by how good her facade was. Nothing in her voice nor visage betrayed her inner turmoil. He could still tell only because of their close relationship and because Camilla's warm smile didn't extend to her eyes anymore. I guess your training with Journey is paying off, Lith said with a normal voice. Whispering for too long would only cause trouble. It has many perks. I meet a lot of interesting people and learn a lot of new skills. After telling Alina they would take a walk for digestion, Lith and Camilla took a stroll on the paths running along the cultivated fields, toward the Tron Woods. Camilla took her army amulet from her dimensional ring and started to browse through the kingdom's medical databases. I've got bad news, you're right. I ran a search cross-referencing male patients and the strangler disease, but no hits. There's not even a mention in scientific papers about past or present cases, Camilla said. The disease was called the strangler because its victims would experience shortness of breath as if someone was gradually increasing pressure on their chest until they couldn't breathe anymore and died of asphyxiation. That's the private network of the six great academies. How the heck do you have access to it? Marth had revoked Litha's privileges the same day he had quit his job as assistant professor. One of those perks I told you about. I think you need help with this. Camilla said. If Camilla and Solis give me the same advice, I better take it. Lith thought. I need you to talk about it with my mom. I do it myself, but I have no plausible excuse to speak privately with her, whereas you could use my birthday present or something as a cover story. Before doing anything, I want to perform a proper check on the disease's progression, but it takes time. Rena is not stupid. If I touch her belly for too long, she'll understand there's something wrong.